G'day YouTube and welcome back to the ASX Portfolio channel. So today we're gonna to be talking about one of my favorite topics, value at risk and conditional value at risk. So why do we care? Well, essentially, you know, on this channel, we talk a lot about expected return and then also variance and variance being associated with the risk of an asset. Well, in a sense, that incorporates both upside potential and downside potential. So in the actual risk estimate that we have of variance, um, potentially we're not so worried about upside moves as we are to the downside moves. So essentially the value at risk measure gives us a way of quantifying what this worst based outcome could be to a certain confidence interval. So over a given time horizon, let's say one day or a week, what is, you know, what is the worst case scenario to a given confidence level, um, a given level of certainty that my portfolio will drop in value? So over a short period of time, measures like value at risk um, are usually associated with point estimates. However, when you go into longer periods of time, the value at risk could be attributed to anything. It could be gross margin at risk, so a business's revenues minus costs. And we know that there's both variance in both of those numbers. You don't always get point estimates for revenue and cost. So assuming those are two distributions, the joint probability distribution of the two of them gives you your gross margin distribution. And sometimes with these longer term estimates, you may be concerned about a business's profit potential in one year or two years. So a gross margin at risk measure is the difference between the expectation of that distribution less a percentile that you're interested in. Whereas when we're looking at value at risk, often we only care about the point estimate for which that, that value occurs. So if I'm trading and I have my portfolio of assets, I'm concerned with to what degree of certainty will my portfolio um, value the next day drop by. I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's very important to understand that at risk measures is not something that's unique to just trading and value at risk. The value can be attributed to anything and businesses are mostly concerned with cash flow at risk, earnings at risk, gross margin at risk, um, and, and, and plenty of other things that you can look at the distributions of and then get some kind of idea of, of what the worst case scenario is going to be in a business year or a business quarter, etc. In fact, a lot of, a lot of um, risk uh, management principles and actual risk limits are based off these at-risk measures. So the difference between the expectation and that percentile. And in the case of VAR, that's used on a small holding period time, usually, as it's a point estimate of your distribution and usually associated with profit and loss. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So more formally, value at risk is associated and usually defined as the maximum loss in a given holding period to a certain confidence level. So by looking at the notation there, it's a little bit confusing. So we actually define things backwards. So given the profit and loss, obviously um, this distribution uh, X is negative for loss and positive for profits. But we're actually interested in another distribution, which is let's say Y equals minus X. So the loss distribution. So where all values of loss are positive and then the values where you're actually making money are negative. So in, in that scenario, this is the formula you use. So by definition then, we're interested in all the periods where the loss exceeds a value to that percentile we're interested in. So we wanna be able to say to 95% certainty that our value at risk will not exceed a certain value. So giving a real world um, scenario, the, the type of questions we might ask about how you set up a value at risk limit would be, what number are you able to cope with? 
to a given amount of certainty over a given amount of uh, time period, holding period, as a loss level. So let's say that um, at the 95th percentile, so 95% chance that my uh, profit is going to be above this value that we're calculating, this VAR, this level. So 95% chance that it's going to be above this level. What value are you happy associated with losing in that period of time to that, that confidence level? And essentially by, by asking yourself these questions, we can, we can then uh, recalculate this, this uh, value every day um, with this model and then kind of judge um, how the market's tracking, maybe our inputs like volatility and things like that need updating on a daily basis. And we can judge where our portfolio is relative to where we're comfortable losing money. So again, I think it's really important to um, again state that this is a model and it's only as good as the inputs that we put into the model. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but um, so I put the mathematical formula there, um, mostly for those who are interested, but um, I guess the most interesting thing there is inf. If you haven't seen that before, it's the infinim um, set is the lowest um, number, the lowest bound of that set of possible values. So what's that saying is that um, we have, we wanna know um, all, all the values that are possible above a given certainty, alpha, give us all of the distribution above that level of certainty, and then what's that lower bound defined in that set? So essentially that's gonna give us our loss limit under VAR. So value at risk was associated with over a given period of time um, to a given confidence level, what is the maximum loss, okay? The maximum loss in that time period. Now that actually doesn't give us much information other than just a threshold value that we can calculate every day and compare against. The interesting question is, on the days that puts the profit and loss distribution into that small percentile, so the, the worst, the five worst days out of 100, essentially, what is my expected loss on those days? Because it's all fair and well to say, hey, this is, this is the loss limit that I expect to within this, this certain period of time, um, to, to this certainty level, but what is that expected loss going to be? And essentially that's what the conditional value at risk calculates. We're interested in the expectation of all those values in that bottom part of the distribution to that alpha, that alpha level, that percentage level. And that gives us a really interesting discussion point on in those worst case events, how can we calculate this? So that leads into the next part. How do we actually go about calculating value at risk and conditional value at risk? Well, obviously looking at that diagram, you can see that the distribution and the tails of that distribution are really important to understanding this. So one of the ways that we can actually not assume too much about these distributions is to use the data that we have available to us. So using past historical information to actually model what our value at risk is with our portfolio now. So this is a great implementation of the model because we don't assume anything about the distribution of each asset. So we use the historical information, including the really fat or potentially fat tails um, for huge downside moves that have happened. And all that information is incorporated into the calculation. So there is a very simple model and it's used in a lot of textbooks, but probably not that much in practice anymore. And that is what everyone thinks of because it's super simple to do is the parametric uh, model. And essentially you have to assume a single distribution for all your assets in the portfolio. And that's a huge limitation. 
So a lot of textbooks um, or people out there just immediately use the Gaussian uh, distribution, the normal distribution um, for all assets, asset returns. And the reason this is used, I guess, in so many textbooks is that it's so easy to implement. So obviously the downside to this model is that you have to assume one distribution for all asset types. And of course, if, if one asset starts, returns, starts pushing those values, uh, testing, testing that distribution, then you have to look at other modeling methods to be able to um, accurately define what your value at risk and conditional value at risk is. So by defining um, a covariance matrix, we were able to accurately produce a joint probability distribution of our, of our correlated assets. So a lot of assumptions in there about the distribution being attributed to all assets, but you know when, when these start testing the limits um, of our modeling and we observe uh, non-normality or things like this in the market, then we have to look at other modeling methods. So the third one is my favorite, Monte Carlo simulation. And essentially what you're doing is you're simulating um, scenarios a number of times. And you can model your assets however you see fit with whatever distribution. So it gives us the most amount of flexibility. Now the problem with this is it's very computationally intensive sometimes. So depending on the time horizon that you're interested in and the accuracy that you need to value um, your risk at, this, this is concerning, it's kind of the, like this give and take between computational complexity, um, which, which you know, takes a long time to run, and how accurate you want it. Because obviously if you want high accuracy over a long period of time, you need to run quite a few simulations. And that in turn is the trade-off. So how, how long can you wait for your model to run to return the numbers uh, to your front office quants the next day? So, so there is, there is some, some trade-offs. So what are the downsides to VAR? So before we even get into some of the further stuff that we're gonna talk about, about the actual modeling itself and the limitations that we're going to oppose with those um, assumptions, there's one larger one. And it, it, it is noted that this isn't such a concern for some people using this metric as it is for others. But the problem essentially comes about non-normality in actual market data, and then we lose the property of sub-additivity. Now, if you've never heard of that before, it's okay. Essentially what it is, sub-additivity is, is a property of a function where if you add, let's say in our example, two stocks to the function, to var, then the value is going to be less than or equal to the value of the summation of both of those assets individually. So to put that in perspective, let's say that we have one asset, volatility um, or standard deviation here, sigma A, and then um, another, another asset, B, sigma B. So essentially our portfolio volatility under normal um, assumptions holds true and it does have the property of sub-additivity, which means that the portfolio variance with both of these assets in together is going to be less than or equal to the summation of each of them individually. However, when you take away uh, normality um, from the distribution and, and you add in real market data and, and the reality of it, you can't just simply sum up um, all these, all these risks of individual assets and be certain that the VAR is going to be less than or equal to the, VAR, the, the value at risk of all these other um, individual portfolios. So this is usually a nice property to have. So that's one big criticism of the model. So summing up, we're going to um, actually try and implement uh, the value at risk and the conditional value at risk four portfolios using these three different methods, the historical, the parametric, and the Monte Carlo simulation. So please stay tuned for that and um, look out for that in the next coming days. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed watching, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button. Have a great day.